Hi, I'm Stephen Prince. I'll be talking with you about Yojimbo and on another disc about Sanjiro, the two films that Kurosawa made about a wandering samurai hero played with great gusto by Toshiro Mifune. In my commentaries on the films, I'll compare them and talk about what Kurosawa wanted to achieve and about their similarities and differences. Yojimbo was an enormous box office hit. Everyone agrees that this is a tremendously entertaining movie, but it's sometimes dismissed as just that. In fact, it's one of Kurosawa's major films, a thrilling comedy of blood and ideas. Kurosawa gives us a fable, a historical fantasy about the destruction of capitalism, and he offered this message right in the midst of Japan's great post-war economic boom. And he starts us off with a monumental opening. Toshiro Mifune strides powerfully into the frame, one mountain in the background and another, Mifune, in the foreground. And Kurosawa is going to follow him in this credit sequence with a lot of low angle close-ups that fill the widescreen frame, as we see here, with his back and shoulders. Mifune is going to dominate the film with a tremendously physical performance, and Kurosawa will show him as a kind of immovable force. Mifune was a big star already when he made this movie, but Yojimbo made him into a legend and an icon. The character is so grand, so powerful, that he becomes mythic, and Mifune became mythic along with the character. It's the role that he became most identified with, and he often played variations on it in other films away from Kurosawa. This role and the performance also changed Mifune's relationship with Kurosawa. In their earlier films, Mifune played a wide variety of character types, which included a frail old man and record of a living being. But after Yojimbo, in their few remaining films together, Kurosawa tended to treat him as a monument, as a strong but remote presence in High and Low and Redbeard. Mifune is at his most charismatic in Yojimbo, but Kurosawa seemed to sense that he had now taken the actor to a place in their work that they wouldn't come back from. So we follow him along in this uh, opening credit sequence with the camera really close to his back, and it's just kind of a textbook example of how you give the camera to an actor. The framing is very tight, very close, and we're going to be seeing this kind of tight framing throughout the opening of the movie. We have a tilt down now, and we see that Sanjiro, the Mifune character, is on a country road. We're near the end of the Tokugawa period. It's around the 1860s a tremendously volatile time that saw Japan on the cusp of modernization. Yojimbo was only the second of Kurosawa's films to be set in the Tokugawa era, and he uses the period here in a highly symbolic way. Because trade was flourishing in the period, Japan had a network of roads that was quite elaborate, and so it makes a great deal of sense that we would find Sanjiro on one of them. Sanjiro is a ronin, or unemployed samurai, who has no lord to serve. Most samurai in the period were living in castle towns. In fact, one of these will furnish us with the setting of our second film. But in Yojimbo, Sanjiro is cut off from this heritage, and so we meet him as a wanderer, a man whose past is gone and who also has no future. Thus, he's quite willing to leave it to fate which branch of the fork ahead he takes. Now, he follows fate here and uh, heads off down one side of that road over a horizon that will take him into the adventures of the film. And when we cut to our next scene, in fact our next shot, we get a perpendicular axis of movement, which is going to be a, a recurring design element in the film. Here you see it cutting across the line of Sanjiro's forward advance. And again, the really tight framing that's going to continue throughout the opening sequences of the film. We're setting up the ending here. We're going to meet this errant son again at the end in a way that gives the movie a very satisfying sense of completion. In the son's fight with his father here, Kurosawa evokes one of the traits of the period, which was an exodus of people from the countryside to towns and cities. Struggling under heavy taxes, farmers often simply walked away from their land, although this was against the law, and they headed for towns where they hoped greater opportunities awaited. So many people left the countryside that Tokugawa authorities began to forcibly return them. Note the wife here working at the loom. Farming families often supplemented their income by manufacturing goods for sale, as the wife is evidently doing here. Much of Japan's industry in the period, in fact, could be found in the countryside. 
In 1859, for example, 90% of the silk that was transported to the capital city of Edo came from the countryside. In the town that Sanjuro is about to enter is a silk merchant, and he evidently gets his fabric from this rural area surrounding the town. So we're getting some setup here, some foreboding about how terrible things are in the town, and the old man here is going to compare uh, Sanjuro to a hungry dog who's been drawn by the smell of blood. It's one of uh, numerous sections in the movie where uh, Sanjuro is compared with dogs. Kurosawa is exploding the conventions of samurai movies by giving us a disreputable, unkempt hero instead of the pious, well-groomed heroes of more standard films. Now we're setting up his entrance into the town. One flourish, uh, the closing of that screen, followed by a wipe going in the opposite direction a soft-edged wipe that Kurosawa uses throughout the movie. And we're in a setting that is very familiar to American viewers. This is the T Street found in so many towns in Hollywood westerns. Indeed, the western was one source of influence on Yojimbo. Kurosawa loved westerns, especially the films of John Ford, and he acknowledged having learned a lot from what he called the grammar of the western. But it would be wrong to describe this movie as a kind of Japanese western, Kurosawa, in fact, is weaving together a number of sources, and the most significant influence was the connection that he saw between Japan's post-war period of rapid economic growth and the upheavals of the Tokugawa era, during which a nascent capitalism was emerging. Always in his period films, looking toward the past, Kurosawa found the dilemmas of the present day. We're coming up now on one of the film's great moments. And here comes rover with somebody's hand and one of the movie's most celebrated and famous images and watch Mifune's great reaction and how Masaru Sato's wonderful score plays that reaction. Sanjiro has seen a thing or two. He's no stranger to violence but this town creeps him out. There's a level of villainy here that he's never encountered before. This blend of comedy and graphic violence was really unusual in 1961. Yojimbo is a comedy, it's a very dark one, in which Kurosawa gets laughs out of killing and dismemberment. And today we see that a lot in movies, but in 1961 it was very, very rare. And as always, it took American cinema some time to catch up with what innovative filmmakers in other countries were doing. It wasn't, for example, until Bonnie and Clyde in 1967 that an American movie mind violence for this kind of comedy, and so Yojimbo stands as a major influence on that subsequent classic. And this is why it's not a good idea to overplay the influence of Hollywood Westerns on Kurosawa. The significant influences have always gone in the other direction, from Kurosawa to Hollywood. This is Hanske, one of the film's many comic figures. He's the town official, completely corrupt and amoral, and very happy to be that way, thank you. He's played by Ikkyo Sawamura, whom Kurosawa used in small roles in Throne of Blood, The Hidden Fortress, The Bad Sleepwell, High and Low, and Redbeard. Outside of Kurosawa, he had a very long and successful run in monster movies, including numerous Godzilla pictures. Again, you can see how cramped the perspective is in many of these shots. The close-up scope frame really restricts what we can see. This, in fact, might be the B camera footage shot by assistant cinematographer Takao Saito who became Kurosawa's chief cinematographer on later pictures. Kazuo Miyagawa, Yojimbo's principal cinematographer, pointed out that a lot of the footage used in the film was actually material that Saito had shot on the B camera because everybody liked this footage. If so, this might account for some of the unusual framing and composition that we see. We get some really good action shots now as these ruffians spill out into the street around Sanjiro, there's a kind of subliminal little camera move here around the periphery of the circle. An interesting thing about Kurosawa's multiple camera shooting is that often the cameras were in motion, which creates real challenges to blocking the action. And watch, uh, watch Mifune's reaction here when he sees uh, our friendly giant with the huge hammer. It's a marvelous deadpan comic take. This is the scruffiest bunch of samurai trash and gangsters that you will ever see. What a bad world this is, filled with giants toting hammers and killers who brag about having done everything bad. And as Sanjuro walks away, they taunt him, comparing him again with dogs. 
Kurosawa uses a moving camera here to follow Sanjiro down the street, filmed from behind, as he will be throughout a good portion of the movie. Now we meet Ganji, played by Ejiro Tono, who appeared in a lot of Kurosawa's movies, including Redbeard, where he played another innkeeper. When Mifune goes inside uh, Ganji's inn, take a look at this shot here, this framing. It's a wonderful wide-angle composition, and we're going to get a lot of action coming up involving uh, the shutters and what we can see through them. At this point in Kurosawa's career, he had pretty much switched over to telephoto lens perspectives. He used wide-angle lenses frequently during the 1940s, but then, beginning in the mid-50s with Seven Samurai, he switched over to telephoto lenses. But what's unusual about Yojimbo and Sanjiro is that we see an unusual amount of wide-angle work in these films, with Kurosawa using the depth of field in the shots, especially in this sequence with Ganji, letting us glimpse things through the shutters and contrast the interior of Ganji's in with action in the street outside. The coffin maker's hammering that we now hear is an element that Kurosawa borrowed from the Hollywood western High Noon. In that movie, Gary Cooper, as the town sheriff, learns that a killer is coming for him on the noon train. Waiting for his arrival, Cooper visits a barber shop and he hears the coffin maker next door hammering away in preparation for all of the bodies that he anticipates. Kurosawa uses the hammering as an identical motif here, but with an even sharper attention given to death as a business enterprise. Later in the film, our coffin maker will despair because there are now so many bodies that nobody bothers with a coffin, and so he loses profit. Ganji gives us now the backstory on the town, and it can be a little complicated for a first-time viewer. What we've got is a conflict between two rival bands of gangsters, and as we will see, each has allied itself with a merchant. Sebei's group backs the silk merchant, Tazemon, and Ushitora's group backs the sake merchant, Kwaman. This alliance is very important to Kurosawa's historical symbolism because we've got more than two groups of gangsters fighting over territory. The role of the merchants, whom we've yet to meet, is not incidental. The money that their trade controls is what has attracted the gangsters in the first place. Sly storyteller that he is, Kurosawa puts the gangsters in the foreground of his story while keeping the fundamental motivation for the war in the background. So what we've really got, in other words, is an economic war, a battle over markets and over which industry silk or sake will predominate. Oh, yeah. Did you do that? <laughs> Kurosawa gives us what starts here as a two-way composition, and then with a camera pan, he makes it three ways all the while exploiting the architectural features of windows and walls to give us frames within the frame. Cinematographer Kazuo Miyagawa was very skilled at this kind of framing, and Kurosawa will carry the motif over into the second film, Sanjiro, as a way of unifying the two movies. Miyagawa felt that widescreen film was like imakimono, the narrative picture scrolls of Japan's 12th and 13th centuries, which often portrayed multiple events within a composition using architecture to mark off separate incidents. Director Kenji Mizuguchi was the individual who first pointed out this connection to Miyagawa. Miyagawa was very impressed with the analogy, and he began to think about photographing what he called three-in-one scenes in Cinemascope, and we'll see a lot of it in Yojimbo. <laughs> Yojimbo is very theatrical. The style is very self-conscious. All of these flourishes with the raising and lowering of slats and camera moves to create frames within the frame are a wonderful device for introducing the major characters. And if Sanjiro sometimes behaves like the author of a story or a film director arranging scenarios and manipulating characters, Ganji here acts a bit like the Benchi in a silent film, narrating the action in this scene, telling us who's who and what they're up to. But we've also got to give credit to cinematographer Kazuo Miyagawa. He was regarded as Japan's greatest cinematographer, and his work includes such classics as Ugetsu, Sancho the Bailiff, and Conflagration. 
Miyagawa and Kurosawa made history in their first collaboration, Rashomon, in 1951, but they didn't get to work together again after that. Miyagawa worked regularly at Daiya Studio and with director Kenji Mizuguchi, while Kurosawa worked at Toho. Being at different studios generally kept them from collaborating in the years following Rashomon. However, by the early 1960s, Daiya had come apart financially and let a lot of people go, including Miyagawa, who had now become a free agent. Kurosawa was in a six-year hiatus in his relationship with his regular cinematographer, and during the five pictures in those years, Kurosawa used four different cinematographers. Kurosawa had his own production company, which was making Yojimbo for Toho, and he had always wanted to work with Miyagawa again. So Kurosawa took the initiative and contacted Miyagawa to see if he was available. And Miyagawa, of course, was delighted. Sanjiro tells Ganji that he's going to stay, that he gets paid for killing, and that really it would be better if all these gangsters were dead. Of course, we want him to stay. We want to see some stylish killing. If he left at this point, we would throw something at the screen. So it's an obvious necessity that he isn't going to leave. Still, though, the inflections in the scene are interesting because all of Kurosawa's heroes in earlier films have had very good reasons for fighting the good fight. But Sanjiro stays because he's bored and because the fight will amuse him. His motivations are a bit more cynical. This again is part of Kurosawa's exploding of the lofty ideals of samurai behavior found in ordinary Chambara. But more importantly, Sanjiro stays because he's Kurosawa's surrogate. He's a fantasy character that Kurosawa has dreamed up for the express purpose of getting rid of gangsters and corrupt businessmen. His monumental and mythic qualities are the indicators that he's Kurosawa's fantasy projection. And Kurosawa lets us in on the joke throughout the movie. This is one reason that Sanjiro sometimes acts like a film director arranging scenes. Notice also as you watch the picture that we never see anything transpire unless Sanjiro is part of that action or is watching it from nearby. Nothing moves unless it's propelled by Kurosawa's fantasy surrogate. Kurosawa described Sanjiro as a samurai of the imagination, one that he dreamed up for the express purpose of getting rid of gangsters. we're about to get some great swordplay action, just what we've been waiting for. To lend the action greater authenticity, Kurosawa used Ryu Kuza as the kendo instructor on both Yojimbo and Sanjiro. Kuza instructed Mifune on proper sword positions, postures, and cutting action. So a word here about what we're about to see can be helpful. When samurai first appeared in the late 7th century, they were known as men of the bow because the bow and arrow was their principal weapon. But by the Tokugawa period, the sword, especially the long sword, the daito, was invested with much symbolism as the essence of a samurai. And in film, samurai have nearly always been depicted as swordsmen. Sanjiro wears his sword as a samurai in the period wood, katana style, blade up in the sheath which is inserted through his obi or sash. The long sword was a weapon for thrusting and slashing. Slashing moves were often done on a horizontal from left to right called yohogiri on a transverse diagonal, kezagiri, or vertically, top to bottom, kiriyatoshi. Sanjiro here will move against three opponents, to the front, right, and left, in a sampogiri, or three-directional cutting attack. And he takes out the first two opponents with yohogiri, horizontal cuts, and executes a gyaku kezagiri, a diagonal upward cut, to take the arm off of the last opponent. These moves all occur in a blinding flash of speed, and Kurosawa is going to film the fight using two cameras at right angles to one another and cuts between them twice. So everything is quick, elegant, chilling, and funny, and it's over in a flash. So you can see some interesting little, what appear to be heat waves rising up uh, in the distance here. There's our two horizontal cuts and our transverse diagonal slash, and plop, down goes the arm. Unprecedented in 1961 to play this kind of thing for laughs. And it's a pretty good prosthetic effect, right? You even see the bone and a little bit of bloody tissue there. There's no arterial spurt, but uh, 
We'll get a little bit of that later, and an even more impressive one, of course, at the end of the second film, Sanjuro. And we go out of the sequence with more of Mifune's splendid walk and its muscular scoring by Masaru Sato. And we're into a scene where Sanjiro is negotiating a price with Sebe, and he's offered three Ryu initially. Throughout the film, there is much discussion of payment in various amounts of Ryu, and so the viewer might justifiably conclude that Ryu were coins. They weren't. Ryu was a unit of weight, just under one ounce, and it was the basic unit of measurement for gold coinage. The most common coin was the Koban, which was worth one Ryu, and CB is offering Sanjiro various increments of Koban. Larger amounts of Ryu were coined. The Oban, for example, was worth 10 Ryu. Issuing coinage was the exclusive prerogative of the Tokugawa authorities. The Koban, for example, was minted starting in 1601 in a foundry established by Eizu Tokugawa. In addition to gold, coins also circulated in silver and copper. Of the three big cities, transactions in Edo used gold, while those in Osaka and Kyoto used silver and copper, in fact, was used everywhere. Because of the different weights and denominations associated with the metals, people had to be able to convert among them, and this became a basic skill and service that merchants provided. And presumably our silk and sake merchants in town do this regularly. The Tokugawa government did not issue paper money, but allowed some of the regional lords to do so on a local level. We're going to get a splendid example here of the way that Kurosawa uses Sanjiro as a kind of magical figure. Things happen as far as what we see only when he's around to watch or participate. So instead of just cutting to the family conference where Sebe and his wife plot to kill him, Kurosawa takes us there only when Sanjiro goes to listen. In this period, the official ideology of personal relationships was Neo-Confucianism, deriving principally from the philosophy of Zhu Xi, who taught that there were five basic human relationships with corresponding obligations father and son, ruler and subject, husband and wife, older and younger brother, and friends. Bonds of loyalty and service marked all of these relationships, and familial piety was one of the deepest ideals and obligations. The need to serve father, husband, and parents, and the obligation of all to work toward the harmony and flourishing of the family's welfare. So Kurosawa stands all of this on its head by giving us a family in which the wife, Orin, is dominant, and in which Odin and Sebe betray the respect for individual life that was an important part of Confucianism by tutoring their son in the art of killing. You only get respect in this economy, Kurosawa is saying, by thieving and murdering. It's a topsy-turvy world that he shows us. And I love that little business there where Sanjiro sticks out his tongue impishly at the geisha. So Kurosawa explodes the idealism about families that was embedded in the state ideology and is also found in a lot of movies, just as he's been exploding the conventions of the samurai in this film. Kurosawa gives us this really tight framing of the three, filmed with the camera at a great distance, the close-up perspective produced by the telephoto lens. This close-up may have impressed the young Italian director, Sergio Leone, who, as most everybody knows, ripped off this movie to make a fistful of dollars. One of Leone's trademarks became extremely tight widescreen close-ups, and he would have found one model for them in that shot of the family. Now we get some introductions. Sebe introduces everyone to Sanjiro. That's Isuzu Yamada playing Odin, making her last appearance in a Kurosawa film. She had been so extraordinary as Lady Asagi in Throne of Blood and as the landlady Osuge in The Lower Depths. Kurosawa is giving us another splendid comic bit here when Sebe asks for Sanjiro's name. The name that Mifune improvises, Kuobatake Sanjiro, is complete nonsense, 30-year-old Mulberry Field. We have a couple splendid axial compositions of the Mulberry Field. Talk about the man with no name. The Clint Eastwood character in Leone's Fistful of Dollars became known as this, but we see now where it originated. Refusing to give Sanjiro a name enables Kurosawa to erase his past and enhance his mythic stature. The great samurai of legend always had a biography and a clear family tree. 
Sanjuro, by contrast, is completely abstract. He's really an empty construction, invented by Kurosawa to get rid of gangsters, and his total blackness is all part of the joke. And Kurosawa's going to repeat this scene almost exactly in the follow-up film, Sanjuro. Now we meet a wonderful old friend. This is Susumu Fujita, playing Instructor Homa. Fujita was Kurosawa's first leading man, and a major figure at the beginning of his career. Fujita was the star of Kurosawa's first film, Sanjiro Sagata, and of its sequel, also directed by Kurosawa. He also played major roles in The Men Who Step on the Tiger's Tail and No Regrets for Our Youth. But after that picture, Kurosawa began to cast Mifune in the lead, beginning with Drunken Angel in 1948. Thereafter, Fujita only made occasional appearances in Kurosawa's films. So this scene here is all about, once again, the film's self-consciousness. It's a scene about how Mifune has replaced Fujita as the big star and commands a larger salary, just like their characters, Sanjiro and Homa. The casting makes all of this very tongue-in-cheek, and it was certainly a good-natured gesture on Fujita's part to help take the scene in this direction. Hanske comes out periodically in the film to beat his wooden clappers together and announce the time, and in this regard, he's a bit like the figure in a kabuki play. Kabuki plays begin with the sound of the wooden clappers, and we get more perpendicular designs here, a lot of shooting down the street with characters cutting across the frame side to side. And we're in a really sly scene now. Orin locks up the geisha to protect the clan property, but really this is a point of view shot. Sanjiro is nearby but off camera, and in a moment Kurosawa is going to pan the camera to follow Orin and then tilt up to reveal Sanjiro standing there. So he's going to radically change our perspective, taking us out of the scene with Olin, and into one that contains one of Kurosawa's biggest winks at his audience. Sanjiro is dallying while Sebe's group nervously waits for him in the street, so they send up that messenger, but uh, before Sanjiro goes down, he looks out the back there, and he sees Homa sneaking away. Homa hops over the back wall, but first there's this great moment where he turns, smiles, and waves to Sanjiro. So we've got Fujita and Mufuni here as the past and present incarnations of Kurosawa's cinema, acknowledging one another and what they represent for Kurosawa before going their separate ways. And Fujita again turns on the road and smiles at Mufune. It's an impish, mischievous smile, and it's certainly Kurosawa's own grin at this little bit of self-referential history that he has staged for us. So Mifune is finally going to go down there to the street, and uh, Sebe thinks he'll throw in his lot uh, with their side, but sandro has got some tricks up his sleeve. And we get another of the film's wide-angle framings, this one to show us the panoramic view of the town and where the two gangs are in relation to one another. It's a good sweeping view of the street, giving us a lot of information about place and setting. Sanjiro is going to play each gang off against the other, and he starts now by betraying his employer. And he's then going to tell Ushitora that he won't fight for Sebe. We're going to get Again, a lot of um, kind of reverse angle shots of the two gangs on the street. Kurosawa does this periodically throughout the film, and it is a kind of visual way of telling us that each gang is almost exactly like the other in terms of its degree of violence and moral depravity. So Sanjuro strides down the street, and uh, this is going to be the first point where we really get to see the other gang boss, Ushitora. And uh, he steps forward here in the distance, and then a closer framing uh, with his giant behind him. Uh, Ushitora seems a bit more ruthless than Sebe, and events will prove that out. So Sanjiro does something a little surprising now. He climbs up into the watchtower to see the fight that he has provoked. He's going to watch the carnage rather like a delighted spectator. Sato's music goes into overdrive, playing the action very aggressively. So note how Sato's burst is followed by Hanske running out, banging his clappers on the door, 
almost singing his warning about a fight. This followed by the rhythmic banging of Tazeman's prayer drum. Yojimbo is acoustically very rich, and much of the sound we hear is very musical. Much of the action on screen is choreographed to music. Sato's score is a little unprecedented in Kurosawa's work. There's almost never been this much music in a Kurosawa film. Sato was the pupil of Kurosawa's regular composer, Fumio Hayasaka. Hayasaka died in 1955 before he could complete the score to Record of a Living Being. Sato stepped in at that point to finish that score, and for the next 10 years, he was Kurosawa's regular composer. Certainly the music in Yojimba was one of the things that people most comment on, and its aggressive qualities, its unusual instrumentation, almost certainly inspired director Sergio Leone and what he wanted to get from his composer, Ennio Morricone, in the spaghetti westerns that he began to make in the 1960s. This is the great age of widescreen cinema. Look at the way Kurosawa brings the two gangs in here at the very edge of the widescreen frame, exploiting the horizontal compositions that this frame format is especially good at displaying. And the musical qualities of the film continue. Listen to the way here that the rhythm of the music segues into the beating of the horse's hooves. The pounding of the hooves becomes part of the score. The sound effect of the horse has been dubbed in time to the beat of the music. So we go out of this musical section by making the ambient sound of the film proper a part of the music. This is again what widescreen filmmaking is all about. Look at how Kurosawa effectively uses the full dimensions of his widescreen 2.35 to 1 frame. You don't see it in movies anymore today because things now are really shot for small television screens. And so directors tend to rely too much on extreme close-ups. We've really lost the aesthetic of widescreen in movies today. Even though a lot of films are made in this ratio, it's rare to see it being used really well, as it is here. Sanjuro perched in the watchtower is a very memorable image. It's one of those moments where his status as Kurosawa's surrogate is most emphatic. He's the director of this little entertainment, watching his handiwork from a distance. Kurosawa, though, was criticized for this imagery. The filmmaker Masahiro Shinoda, who directed Double Suicide, and who had just completed his first film the year before Yojimbo, was a bit harsh toward Kurosawa, and said that the spectacle of Mifune in the watchtower, disengaged from the conflict below, summed up what Shinoda felt was the problem of Kurosawa's films in this period, that they weren't politically engaged. For him, the Watchtower imagery was emblematic of Kurosawa's not making films that were part of the popular political struggles of the period, which were numerous and were coalescing around such things as the security pact with the U.S., the American military bases in Japan, industrial pollution, and construction of the new Narita airport on expropriated farmland. A new activist generation of Japanese filmmakers was emerging in the late 1950s and early 1960s with a more radical approach to film style and story. These included Nagisa Oshima, whose Night in Fog in Japan released in 1959 and about the protests surrounding the renewal of the Japan-U.S. Mutual Security Pact heralded a very different approach to cinema than what Kurosawa's generation had practiced. And to these new directors, Kurosawa seemed old-fashioned. This judgment would cause him a lot of pain over the years. He would come to feel very cut off from the younger generation of filmmakers. Obviously, though, Kurosawa's films have stood the test of time, but even on its own terms, the criticism was specious. Kurosawa's movies have always been very topical and socially engaged. Record of a Living Being, High and Low, Drunken Angel, Ikiru, Take your pick, and you've got dramas about nuclear weapons, corporate corruption, economic injustice, poverty, and disease. So while we note how funny and colorful it is to have Sanjuro up on that watchtower, it's also worth recalling how the imagery resonated with a particular period of film history in Japan. 
and the judgment against Kurosawa held by a number of the emerging directors of that time. Kurosawa and Miyagawa give us more of their delightful peephole compositions, showing us Hanske bribing the official on behalf of the town's gangsters and merchants. Government under the Tokugawas was known as Bakuhan because it combined the central Tokugawa administration, the Bakufu, with localized government within the domains of the various lords, known as Han. The Tokugawa had placed loyal warlords close to the capital of Edo and placed those of questionable loyalty in provinces much farther away and then required them to leave their domains periodically for extended stays in Edo. So political control was a skillful blend of the central and the local, and the town in Yojimbo was evidently quite far from a major urban area. The low-level bribery that Kurosawa is showing us here is something that commentators in the Tokugawa period lamented. The neo-Confucianist Kyuzo Muro wrote a complaint that perfectly describes what Kurosawa is showing us here. The provinces are full of avaricious officials and the towns are full of money grubbers, he wrote. Many of them, while they seem outwardly to obey the law and be above bribery, work privately for profit and love luxury, extravagant and vain and profligate. No wonder we are in such a condition, end quote. So Kurosawa really embraces this kind of neo-Confucianist condemnation of money grubbing and materialism. Now we meet the merchants, the figures who were really behind the conflict in the town. First up is Tokuemon, the sake merchant, who's played by our old friend Takashi Shimura, who's been in many Kurosawa movies. Then Kurosawa does a skillful pan and track in opposite directions to show us the approach of Tazemon, the silk merchant, who was played by another fabulous member of Kurosawa's stock company, Kamatari Fujiwara. Fujiwara played an astonishing range of characters for Kurosawa, including the alcoholic actor in The Lower Depths, the dying saintly old man in Redbeard, the scurvy peasant in The Hidden Fortress, and the mealy bureaucrat Wada in The Bad Sleep Well. Really, there was little that Fujiwara couldn't play for Kurosawa, and his casting of Shimura and Fujiwara in the roles says much about the importance that he attached to these merchant characters. And Kurosawa created a bridge to the follow-up film, Sanjiro, by casting them again as a pair of villains. So here comes our lovable psychopath in Okushi. I love the dusky look that Kurosawa and Miyagawa achieve in this section of the film. Look at the bright windows in those distant buildings. They've hung translucent material over those openings and are blasting it from the other side with really high-intensity light inside those sets. It gives us a wonderful contrast to the dusky exteriors. Uh, Daisuke Kato plays Inokishi in a splendid comic performance as this dim-witted but vicious psychopath. While Inokishi introduces himself, named for a boar, and given that likeness in the makeup, take a look at the distant background. You'll see Hanske in the building across the street dancing about in his ritual of bribery. Kurosawa has choreographed action in the two sets at real distance from one another and has lit them and blocked the action for this camera setup. A lot of viewers will only look at the foreground action, so Kurosawa's really gone an extra mile and a half here, and that's why he's so great. So Orin arrives, and she's going to flirt a little bit with Sanjiro, a playful tap on the shoulder, but uh, Inokushi intervenes. And they have a little standoff here, the two of them uh, antagonized at one another, and uh, it's, a, it's a splendid little comic uh, duel, each piling money on the table. And look at the great expression that uh, Daske Kato gives us here. Look at the way he kind of puffs out that upper lip. A little bit like a boar. And we've got one of those intense Kurosawa rainfalls with our characters in a waiting game until the official leaves and everybody on their best behavior, practicing the kind of duplicity toward officials that Kyuzo Moro had condemned. Sanjiro was waiting for somebody to bring him a big pile of money and Ganji occasionally chides him about not being a true samurai because he's always asking for money. Kurosawa is playing with the ideal of Bushido in the period that stipulated that samurai should live frugally and simply. Ironically, the code of Bushido was written down for the first time in this period by the neo-Confucianist Soko Yamaga 
at a time when samurai had little to do as warriors because the Tokugawa era was largely peaceful. Most samurai lived in castle towns with their lords and were paid in rice, measured in units called koku. One koku was about five bushels, but samurai might also receive some pay in cash because they needed spending money when they accompanied their lords to Edo. And there, many borrowed money to finance gambling, drinking, and prostitution, and thereupon fell into debt to the merchants. This indebtedness was a terrible ideological contradiction, and it fueled great anger. The Tokugawas had implemented a rigid class structure that placed samurai at the top. Next were farmers, then artisans and tradespeople, and at the bottom of the class hierarchy were the merchants. So it was intolerable for prestigious samurai to be beholden to lowly and despised merchants. The period was a confusing one for samurai who no longer had wars to fight. And many, like Sanjiro, were ronin. The number of ronin swelled in the period because the Tokugawas expropriated land from warlords of suspect loyalty and banished them to far regions, at which point those warlords let many of their samurai go. But more seriously, the centuries-old connection between warrior and farmer had been broken. Samurai were now without land, whereas in prior eras many had worked as farmers. The warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who unified Japan just prior to Tokugawa rule, had disarmed the countryside in 1588 in what became known as his sword hunt. He forbade farmers from carrying swords, spears, or firearms. This was a way of controlling the era's many violent peasant uprisings. This policy created a rigid distinction between soldiers and farmers and thereby effectively cut samurai off from their land and made their existence more precarious. Now they were a kind of salaried employee. Banzan Kumazawa, a high-ranking samurai in the period, lamented that this development was ruining the samurai class. He wrote, Ever since the samurai and farmers became separate classes, the samurai have become sickly and their hands and feet have grown weak. A noble and lasting social order can only be built on a farmer-samurai basis. Now is the time to restore the farmer-soldier of olden times, he concluded. But the two were never restored, and our character of Sanjiro is emblematic of the times. This is part of the joke that his name represents. Samurai status was hereditary, and only samurai had a surname and a given name. So Sanjiro tells us he comes from a family of mulberry fields, a joking reference to the past century of landless warriors. The figure of the ronin, though, also lends itself very well to the kind of myth-making that Kurosawa is doing here. In this regard, there is a faint resemblance to the gunfighters of the American Western. Wandering characters lend themselves very well to adventure stories because their behavior can be spontaneous and unconstrained. Nobody is out and about in the town. The absence of a social life gives us one measure of the town's desolation. And one of the film's most interesting motifs is that characters spend their time hiding indoors because being outside is so dangerous. Kurosawa is showing us in the partnership between the gangsters and the merchants and the struggle over markets, a primitive capitalism where cutthroat competition is quite literally that. For Kurosawa, the past always contains the outline of the present day. And so what he's also evoking here is the power of big business in contemporary Japan and its alliance with the Yakuza, the professional mobsters. Kurosawa acknowledged that the Marxism of his youth remained alive in his thinking. And so what he shows us in this desolate town, and particularly in upcoming plot developments, is akin to Karl Marx's observation that capitalism deforms human relationships by subjecting everything to the competition and control of the marketplace. Many characters, like Ushitora's giant, or Inokishi, are literally deformed, and this town is dehumanized and dead because it is run by the merchants and the gangsters who work for them. Kurosawa is leaping over some action here. Another villain has arrived in town, Unosuke, and he's arranged a truce between the gangs. Sanjiro ponders what this means and how it will affect his plans, while the coffin maker despairs that he's going to lose business. Atsushi Watanabe plays the coffin maker. He's an actor that Kurosawa often used in very small roles, so he has a kind of subliminal presence in Kurosawa's movies. You can also see him as a hospital patient in Redbeard, a slum dweller in The Lower Depths, a bun seller in Seven Samurai, 
and in one of his most memorable roles as the hospital patient who explains the symptoms of cancer to the worried hero of Ikiru. So we're ramping up now for the entrance of our last major bad guy, Unosuke, who will be Sanjiro's chief antagonist. He's played by Tatsuya Nakadai, making his first real appearance in a Kurosawa film. He had a tiny walk-on part in Seven Samurai, but this is his first major role for Kurosawa, who would continue to use him, of course, most expansively in Kagamusha and Ron. So we're going to get a splendid entrance from Nakadai. He's uh, already out there on the street, and we hear Hanske giggling. And when we raise the slat, we're going to see him appearing amidst the howling winds and dust. There he is. And he's going to be carrying a pistol that he's acquired on one of his travels. Unosuke's pistol ensures that his antagonism with Sanjiro plays also as a contest of gun and sword and thereby encapsulates the historical dynamic between traditional Japan and the currents of modernization that were beginning to move swiftly through the country and would help ensure the downfall of the Tokugawa shogunate. Although the Tokugawa bakufu tried to ban the use of firearms as a means of protecting itself, many guns remained in the possession of warlords, though these tended to be single-shot flintlock weapons. But as you can see here, Unosuke is carrying a pistol capable of repeated fire, so it's a very modern weapon. And Kurosawa is suggesting that he got it from one of the Western powers, such as the Dutch, which were permitted to operate limited trade at one point. Where he's been, we can't say, but the pistol he carries is emblematic of the future and of the chaos that beset late Tokugawa times. So this turbulent period in Japan's history is evoked also through these thugs in the street. They are a mixture of samurai and yakuza, the latter term designating Japan's professional gangsters. In Japanese popular culture, yakuza are as legendary and romanticized as samurai, and there are probably as many movies about yakuza as about samurai. Kurosawa, though, never romanticizes yakuza. He thinks gangsters are ridiculous. But in his movies, he's always an honest historian, and so he places Yakuza into the film because it was in this period of Tokugawa history that they emerged. The name Yakuza literally means 893, which is the worst hand of cards that you can hold in a game of Hanafuda. And so it designated society's losers, but ones who wore their outcast status proudly. They had numerous roots, one of which included samurai, and so that crowd in the street represents a blurring of boundaries between samurai as warriors and samurai as gangsters. Their costumes are a little outlandish. Recall the exaggerated dress of the group of ruffians that Sanjiro fought with earlier. With these costumes, Kurosawa evokes the crazy outlaw samurai of the period who were known as kabukimono, whose behavior and dress were wild. They specialized in street fighting and killing and evolved into yakuza. Yakuza also descended from the Bakuto, the gamblers, and Ushitora is one of these. I'm always surprised by this boat in the water here because the town seems so dry and dusty generally that it's startling to realize there's some water nearby. You can see Kurosawa's fondness for creating hot spots on the rear wall of his sets. He does it throughout his period films and it gives his movies a deeply burnished look. We're about to have an interesting attack here Sanjiro uh, keeps his sword in the saya or sheath when he hits the first fellow. What he does is to make a kojiri ate, a thrust with the end of the sheath into the solar plexus of his victim. We will see him do this a lot in the follow-up film Sanjiro. The move is an incapacitating martial arts maneuver, and he brings down the second guy here with a yohogiri. The giant barrels add a great graphic touch, and this poor guy thinks he's dead. But he's startled to realize, in fact, that he's quite alive and that Sanjiro's sword has merely cut his kimono. When he stands, it falls away to reveal the tattoo on his back. Quite a spectacular effect. These tattoos were one of the marks of the Yakuza. Often they are full-body tattoos, quite common beginning in the late 17th century. 
If the tattooing was done in a traditional way, as it would have been in this period, it was a very painful process, accomplished using a carved piece of bone or wood with barbs on one end. And it could take up to 100 hours of having your skin punctured to create a full body tattoo. Rather like the samurai ritual of seppuku, though, the point was to show that you could take the pain, and also to show that you embraced your outlaw status with this mark as a social outsider. I find the lighting in this scene to be a little harsh. The effect is meant to be that candlelight or some kind of illuminated torch is casting the shadows that we see on the back wall, but they don't look much like shadows cast by candlelight. They're a bit too hard and pronounced. They look like they're created by strong electric lights, as they are. Sometimes Kurosawa would overdo the lighting of his interiors. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, the impression it creates is a little startling. I've been saying all along that Yojimbo is a kind of musical, and now we get an official musical performance as uh, Odin has her geisha try to tempt Sanjiro, and uh, he's not going to um, not going to take her up on her offer. So instead, he threatens them with the loss of the two prisoners, tells them to lock them up, and uh, we go into a splendid little bridging sequence that connects the two larger sequences. Mufuni on the walk with Masaru Sato's music scoring his powerful movements. So when he gets to Ushitora and asks to see the big boss, the underling heads up the stairs calling Oyaba. This is a significant term in the world of the Yakuza and I want to say a few words about it. But first, there's an interesting bit of music scoring that I want to call our attention to. When Ushitora comes down the stairs, Sato is going to score each step with a burst of music. It's a very literal way of playing the scene. First, one step will get uh, musical underscoring, and then two steps, and then one again. And there's one. Bam, bam, and then a last one. This very literal way of playing the action is considered a really heinous crime in the world of movie music. In American cinema, it's called Mickey Mousing, since it gives things a cartoonish quality. But that's exactly what Kurosawa is after, and so he's willing to have Sato break this rule and write music of a sort that he otherwise wouldn't. Again, this is something that the two of them will reprise in the second film, Sanjiro. So now let's talk about the term Oyaban. It's often translated as boss, which is accurate enough, but that doesn't convey the subtext of the term, which also means parent. The Yakuza developed what was called the Oyaban Koban membership structure, which involved the relation of extreme loyalty and dependency among the Koban, the gang members, who were as children, with the leader or Oyabun as the father member. I think Inokishi is a little bit flirtatious here. And uh, Kurosawa has Sandro and Inosuke draw a part in that framing, which again is one that can pass for deep focus even though it really isn't. I love the lighting in these dusky night exteriors, and Mifune is so great with all of his nonverbal action, the shoulder swag, the chin scratching. It's a really a brilliantly underplayed performance. The gestures are not overdone. Now watch this killing scene carefully. When Inokishi slashes into Yoichiro's bodyguard, who's a little too timid for his own good, Kurosawa gives us a spectacularly baroque piece of violence. Inokishi cuts into an artery and elicits a rather spectacular eruption of blood spurting out under pressure from the victim's chest or neck. Kurosawa is a little subtle about it, placing the action in the background of the shot and then having the victim slowly die during the remainder of the scene. But it's still an impressive effect. This is the first time, in fact, that we see an arterial spurt in Kurosawa's work. The arm chopping earlier in the film was completely bloodless. 
but now our killings are getting a little bit messier. And of course, Kurosawa will go on to give us a pair of really spectacular arterial spurts in the subsequent films, Sanjiro and Ron. And now this here is my favorite shot in the whole film. Look at this. They almost look like they're going to crash into each other. It's all the perspective created by the telephoto lens. It's probably the most spectacular of our perpendicular axes of movement in the film. Kurosawa's telephoto lenses create such a stylized way of presenting movement. It's one of the things I most love about his work. Partly it's just the way this looks on a sensual level, and it's also how Kurosawa goes way out into his own radical territory in defining how movie images should look. Lots of directors have used telephoto lenses, but nobody does it like him. Ganji is a little bit perturbed here. He asks Sanjiro if it's all part of a show that he's arranged. And Sanjiro acknowledges that some of it is, but like a good director, he's got to improvise around the contributions of Inosuke. So we're coming up now on two rather extended sequences in the film, which are back-to-back -back kind of mirror images. The white takes us into the first one, both sequences deal with the exchange of hostages, and they both open like this, like a kabuki play, with Hanske's wooden clappers signaling the onset of action. Both sequences are the most elaborately formalistic of the film, in which Kurosawa gives us a series of shots that are reciprocal compositions of one another, alternating back and forth. It creates a kind of funhouse mirror effect. Here you see this shot and then this shot. They're really mirror images of one another. Our two characters are positioned exactly the same in the frame, and we've got similar action. The hostages are brought on from the side of the frame, almost as if on the wings of a theater. So it's a funhouse mirror effect, images reflecting images, in which the idea is that the evil and duplicity of each gang is reflected back at the other, again and again, so that they become exactly alike visually, as of course they are morally. These mirrored compositions define a world where evil and wickedness is endemic and is replicating itself endlessly. So we have our two groups converging on this diagonal in the street, and uh, Unosuke's got a little trick up his sleeve. It's the first point in the movie where we really get to see the pistol used as an instrument of death and how effective it is. And it also suggests the greater degree of ruthlessness that Ushitora's gang possesses relative to Sebe. Sebe, of course, will be the great loser in this, uh, this struggle over markets. So now we've got our, our killings, and uh, we're crossing the line of action that we've established in the opening shot of the sequence. In fact, we're going to be crisscrossing that line of action quite a bit in the upcoming uh, shots and camera setups. Now, this being the first time that we've seen the gun in action, it serves to raise the narrative question of how Sanjura with his sword can beat Unosuke with that pistol. Look at how flamboyantly presentational these designs are. The way that Kurosawa brings characters out of the buildings onto the street as if onto a stage from the wings. They cross the street in a straight line at a precise 90 degree angle to the street itself. It's a very calculated way of moving the characters and when they go back into the building off of the frame, look how artificial it is. The actor playing Sebe here, for example, has got his body turned fully parallel to the street as he crosses it while holding his head at a right angle to his body as he moves. It's a very unnatural way of moving. And lest we think that we've been privileged to see all of this without Sanjiro being present as our Kurosawa surrogate, he climbs down from the watchtower where he's been a silent spectator of the action like ourselves. So that's the end of our first hostage sequence. Now we go into our second, which opens exactly the same way with this framing of the street on a slight diagonal in the frame. The revelation that Sebe has kidnapped the young mother who's been enslaved by Tokwemon 
is an important indicator of Tuquemon's importance to Ushitora. Sebe, after all, is bargaining for the life of his son. This aspect of the film, and this long second sequence of hostage exchanges, shows us how central the merchants are to the conflicts in the movie. Ushitora's willingness to exchange Yoichiro for Tokwemon's mistress tells us that the economic alliance with Tokwemon is vital to his organization. Actually, it is a political economic alliance in that Ushitora gets a cut of Tokwemon's revenues in exchange for using his muscle on behalf of Tokwemon's business interests. Kurosawa intends this aspect of the film to precisely mirror the realities of contemporary Japan that he knew all too well. The Yakuza had flourished in the years after World War II when they controlled the black market, and Kurosawa showed this in an earlier film, Drunken Angel. Then during the years of Japan's great economic boom from 1950 to 1970, the Yakuza forged powerful connections with top officials in government and business. Kurosawa was aware of numerous such examples. Yoshio Kodama, for example, was a former war criminal and a well-known Yakuza godfather who made large financial contributions to the Liberal Democratic Party and helped elect several of its highest officials. The LDP's prime minister, Nobusuke Kishi, had been jailed with Kodama by the occupation as a war criminal, and the two men were close. At the time Kurosawa was making this movie, in 1960, Demonstrators had mobilized against the renewal of the U.S.-Japan Security Pact, which allowed American forces to operate military bases in Japan and be equipped with nuclear weapons. Fearing the demonstrators, Kishi and the LDP took steps to create an army of gangsters who would crack down on them and intimidate them, and Kodama acted as an emissary between the LDP and the big Yakuza bosses who'd agreed to help. 18,000 Yakuza were to be mobilized, and a street fight did ensue, but in the end, the treaty was passed. A decade later, the fertilizer company that had poisoned Minamata Bay with tons of mercury, giving rise to what became known as Minamata disease, hired Yakuza to protect its corporate headquarters and boardroom from the residents of Minamata, who had been poisoned and were now protesting. So the tradition of using Yakuza as muscle to effect political or business goals was an enduring one. And in their turn, Yakuza were quite adept at extorting money from often unwilling corporations. Gangsters who specialized in this trade were known as sokaiya, or corporate racketeers. They are thought to have originated in the Tokugawa period from ronin who sold their services as bodyguards, or yojimbo, as Sanjiro is doing in the film. He's basically extorting money from Sebe and Ushitora, so in this regard our hero is enacting a more widespread practice of the period, and one that evolved into an enduring criminal enterprise. Police statistics in 1981, for example, put the number of corporate racketeers at close to 7,000 and the revenue they extorted in dollars at 400 million. So we're seeing all of this in nascent form in the relationships between the Yakuza bosses, Sebe and Ushitora, and their merchants. Kurosawa is showing us these facets of modern Japan in an embryonic form as they emerge from the turbulence of late Tokugawa times. And in this regard, Sanjiro is really fighting against the emergence of modern corporate capitalism. It's a fight that he's doomed to lose, at least in historical reality. But Kurosawa is indulging himself in fantasy here, and so he's going to permit an outcome that, in point of fact, couldn't and didn't occur. The second hostage exchange sequence climaxed with more of the movie's satire on family relationships and the sentimental Confucian ideology that attaches to them in the movies. Throughout Yojimbo, Kurosawa creates a kind of motif out of children crying for their mother, Oka, and he contrasted the desperate cries of Nui's child with the panicked cries of Yoichiro as he runs for his mother, Orin. And at the end of the film, he is going to again reprise the cry of Oka, this time performed by yet another character. So we're in a sequence now that evokes the distress of Kohei, the uh, downtrodden husband whose gambling has gotten his family into trouble. Uh, Kohei is not a corrupt or rapacious character like the gangsters, but he is somebody who's been seduced by the lure of money and the lure of gambling, 
And he's gotten his family into a difficult situation because as collateral for his loans, Ushitora and Kweman have kidnapped his wife and are basically uh, keeping her as a kind of sex slave for uh, to Kweman. So Kohei is going to slink off now to be near his kidnapped wife. He's not a grotesque character, not a cartoon, but rather an ordinary person. Even so, the lure of money is strong because the world in this film is very wicked, quite fallen and tainted by the growth of a money economy. Kohei and Nui can only be its victims, made to suffer by it. So it's going to be up to Sanjiro to make things right, but Kurosawa first has some fun with the difference between reality and illusion by pretending to hate Kohei for his spinelessness. But we know different, and so now Sanjiro is going to be moved to act by the spectacle of undeserved human suffering. He strides to Ushitora's place, aiming to set up a scenario by which he can free Nui from her captors. And this is a pivotal moment in the film because now he's going to take direct action and forcibly intervene in the Yakuza conflicts. And by doing so, he's going to set in motion a chain of events that he can no longer control. Inokashi, sweet psychotic that he is, seems a bit taken by Sandro, and I don't know, that's a little bit of a flirtatious look there, I think, perhaps a bit of longing in that look. Uh, Ino once again tells Unosuke that uh, Sandro is very strong. You can see here again how skillfully Kurosawa and Miyagawa exploit the widescreen frame and allocate a small section of it, a frame within the frame, for their composition. And the actors have to be very careful here to hit their marks, as when Nakadai cross behind Ushitora to stay in the shot. Kurosawa moves the camera forward a bit now to get rid of the framed effect and to fill the screen. So Sanjiro puts his plan into action by suggesting that he and Ino go check on Nui. Sanjiro sweet talks Ino into coming with him by returning the compliment about being a strong man. And Ino takes a child's delight in this, and uh, Ushitora agrees that they should go. So Sanjiro has shrewdly sized up Ino. He knows how to prey on his ego by flattering it. Sanjiro is clearly manipulating the two gangs, and he's hoping to stay above the fray. He's hoping to not get physically caught up in the fight, but this is the pivotal scene in the film where, in fact, he's going to take an action that will come back to hurt him later on. In the edit that comes up here to that shot, you can see Kurosawa's fondness for shooting with two cameras using approximately the same line of sight, but at varying focal lengths, so that he gets a big enough change in image size across the cut, but almost no change in the camera's angle of view. Now things are going to be happening very fast as Kurosawa shows us what a great action filmmaker he is. Once the killing starts inside the hut, note that Kurosawa does it all with only two cameras, cutting back and forth between them, and note also how extreme the perspective of the close-up camera is. The action is highly compressed in a telephoto perspective. And note also that Kurosawa will slightly undercrank the cameras to give the action a more furious speed. The shot that launches the attack, this one coming up with Sanjiro on the run caught by a panning camera, is one that Kurosawa reprises in the second fight scene in Sanjiro. So here we go, a series of kendo moves, slashes with the sword, and the action slightly speeded up, extreme telephoto compression there in that shot. Back to uh, our first camera, and watch when Mifune throws the clothing onto the floor, how foreshortened everything looks. They go outside, and Kurosawa reprises the child's crying oka, and Sanjiro shows that he really does care nothing for money, by giving his Rio to the family. All of the physical action in this scene was quite rough on Mifune, who was now around 40 years old. This is rough business here, having to drag a fully grown man back inside, but Mifune carries it off quite well. I really love this scene, even more than the fight that preceded it. Somehow it seems even more ferocious. Part of the reason, obviously, is the sheer physical energy that Mifune shows. But the other reason is that Kurosawa and Miyagawa use the camera differently here. 
Note all the small, sharp, quick pans and tilts, some so small and fast as to be almost subliminal as the camera follows Mifune. Kurosawa isn't using a handheld camera, but all of this quick, sharp reframing creates almost the feeling of handheld action, a quality of instability, improvisation, unpredictability. And the tightness of the telephoto framing accentuates these qualities. It's a really shrewd use of the camera, and it's unique to this scene. Kurosawa would go on to use a handheld camera in his next film, High and Low, in an action scene set on a train to create these qualities of jerkiness and energy. And he was evidently inclined in that direction here in Yojimbo, but he got the same effect instead with a traditional camera locked to a mount. We've got a really nice 90 degree edit there with a big change in camera perspective going from the close-up of Mifune to this wider framing that put everyone at opposite ends of the scope frame. And of course, Sanjiro doesn't want any gratitude. It's dangerous. And Kurosawa returns to the difference between illusion and reality with Sanjiro's pretense that he will kill them if they don't stop prostrating themselves. The lighting in the shot coming up where the runners gradually emerge out of the darkness is quite nice. These are all exterior shots and you can see sometimes their breath hanging slightly frosty in the air there. So here we got the shot where they just come right out of the shadows. The lighting is really effective. And Sandro is going to show off his handiwork, and uh, it's quite a splendid production. He is simultaneously the director and the set designer of this show. And you can see how artfully he's arranged everything. If you watch the trailer for the film, you'll see an alternate take of this action here. Toho Studio often used alternate takes in its trailers. In this case, it's a closer view afforded by Takao Saito's B camera, which doesn't show as much of the carnage. Kurosawa decided to go with the master shot framing because it looks more epic and gives a better sense of Sanjiro's power. So we've had a reverse field composition, changing the shot perspective by 180 degrees. And we've got three characters in the foreground, midground, and background, looking like they occupy a single plane of space. A slow build, and catch the way Ushitora's growl is picked up by Sato's score. Now we leap a bit forward in the story to show a series of retaliations by the gangs against each other and an escalation in the violence. First up is the burning of Tazeman silk, with the billowing black smoke providing a current of visual energy in the scene. We cut back and forth between the two gang members snarling at one another, and Kurosawa is going to give us a great effect. We're going to go to a close-up of Unosuke with Nakadai grinning demonically, and Kurosawa is going to let the fire come up behind his face in a way that accentuates the depravity and the violence of the character. It's, it's like a big exclamation point. Uh, Kurosawa clearly got a kick out of it. Sebe answers this violence with an attack on Tokwemon's Saki warehouse, and this precipitates a general slaughter as Kurosawa will leap forward yet again to shots of the town with its street filled with corpses. Incidentally, uh, these sequences where the gangs are attacking one another are the only ones in the movie where Sanjiro's presence or participation is not explicitly revealed. So poor old Tokwemon has lost all of his sake, and you can see uh, Takashi Shimura looking a little bit uh, frail here. He's getting on in years, and that's why his roles in Kurosawa's films have been diminishing. Now this transition is a very dry joke, the wipe to the burnt rooftop and the desolate street below. And we get a very leisurely pan of the rooftop, giving us time to savor the joke and see where Kurosawa is going to take us. There are quite a few bodies here, surrounded by drying blood sprays. There's been a terrific battle, but obviously Kurosawa has skipped over it. A lesser filmmaker would have made the battle into a major set piece and spent a lot of screen time on it. I like the way this guy's hand sticks up there quite uh, expressionistically. It's uh, just a wonderful flourish, uh, one of many in the film. 
Kurosawa is making a comedy, and so he's more interested in staging this dry joke than simply showing us what has already followed from Ushitora's anger at the loss of the sake. And so all the killing in this section of the movie occurs off camera. And we pick up the forlorn coffin maker, now in despair because the town's economy has been ruined. There are too many bodies, and he stands to make no profit. As we watch this increasing scale of violence, it's becoming clear that Kurosawa has something very special in mind. Yojimbo, it turns out, is an apocalyptic film, and what Kurosawa is going to show us is the end of the world, at least as it has been defined by the transition from feudalism to a modern business economy. To the extent that this town represents not just the past, but also contemporary Japan and our own present day, then the destruction that we're witnessing comes to assume truly epic proportions. Sanjiro is going to be satisfied with nothing less than the total destruction of this world and all of its evildoers. Thus the fires that we've seen and the killing of these villains take on a cleansing function. Through his fantasy surrogate, Sanjiro, Kurosawa is imaginatively ridding the world of the political and economic corruption that these gangsters and merchants represent. In his book, Totem and Taboo, Sigmund Freud described what he called the omnipotence of thought in explaining the appeals of magic rituals. Objects are overshadowed by the ideas representing them, he wrote. What happens in the realm of ideas must also happen in the world of objects. It's a belief in the power to remake reality according to the nature of a wish. Magic works this way, and so too does art. So Kurosawa is turning back the clock. He's resetting the historical process. He's remaking contemporary Japan by reconfiguring that moment in the 19th century when an economy of money replaced an economy of rice. Kurosawa's film, then, is a way of imaginatively remaking history according to his wish. And so he permits his disdain for materialism and a merchant economy to destroy this world and wipe it clean. And the instrument of that destruction will be Sanjiro. This is Nakadai's first long dialogue scene in the film, and his character was quite a change of pace for him. He had appeared in the first two films of Masaki Kobayashi's trilogy, The Human Condition, a trenchant critique of Japan's experiences in World War II, and he would make the third film following Yojimbo. Because his character for Kobayashi was a virtuous and long-suffering hero, he was quite happy to change gears and play a villain for Kurosawa. When Kurosawa used him again in Sanjiro, again as Mifune's antagonist, he would play a powerful and scheming yet honorable samurai. So this part in Yojimbo is the only time he got to play an out-and-out -out villain for Kurosawa. Now watch his eye movements here. He's going to grab the sword, but he looks at it three times before he does so. That's an interesting way of playing the scene, and I think it's quite effective. Take a look also at that plaid scarf that he's wearing. That's a piece of Western clothing. Another suggestion, along with his pistol, that Unosuke has been somewhere significant besides this nothing little village, someplace that he's encountered the cultural presence of the West, which was making itself felt in Japan despite the Tokugawa efforts to close the country's borders to outside powers. Kurosawa has always been very keenly attuned to periods of historical transition and chaos because they correspond with his own experience of Japan in wartime and post-war collapse. And so Inosuke's pistol and his costuming reflect this turbulence and transitional period. These tensions between tradition and modernization inform a lot of Kurosawa's films. And in the period films especially, guns have been his favored tokens of the modern world. Kurosawa loved American films, and this sequence was very clearly influenced by the beating scene in a 1942 Paramount film called The Glass Key, in which Alan Ladd is held prisoner by gangsters. He's guarded by two men, one of whom is a big, hulking brute who specializes in beating him senseless. And this character, therefore, may be the prototype for our giant who carries the hammer. Watch this uh, nice way that they do the reveal on the face here when Mifune turns around and we see the, the extent of the beating. 
A lot of the details in the scene are modeled on the staging in the corresponding scene in the glass key. The opening shot, for example, in each film shows the two card-playing gangsters with their groaning victim prone behind them. In each scene, we have a hawking brute, a hero with a severely damaged face, an interruption to the beating while the gang boss and a reluctant associate try to question the hero, a long crawl across the floor by the wounded hero trying to escape, and the use of trickery to finally do so. The violence in the beating scene in The Glass Key was unusually harsh for its period and elicited letters of protest from movie viewers to Hollywood's Production Code Administration, which admitted that the film should not have gone out to theaters in the way that it had, without trims to the beating scene. Kurosawa has been expanding the parameters of screen violence throughout Yojimbo, and in this sense it's significant that he found inspiration in a movie that did exactly that in an earlier period in Hollywood. Dashiell Hammett's 1929 novel, Red Harvest, is often cited as one of the influences on Yojimbo because it is a story about a hero who comes to a mining town where criminal gangs are battling each other and manages to get the gangsters to wipe each other out. But apart from this general story situation, there's little in Red Harvest that seems to have influenced Yojimbo, although certainly with his leftist politics, Hammett would have understood what Kurosawa is up to here. In contrast to Red Harvest, the staging of the violence in The Glass Key is a clear influence, and the Paramount film in turn was based on a Dashiell Hammett novel published in 1931. So if there is an influence from Hammett, it derives from The Glass Key rather than Red Harvest. Incidentally, Hammett entitled the chapter that contained the beating scene, The Doghouse, and the action began with the hero, Ned Beaumont, being attacked by a dog and having his forearm severely bitten. As we've already noted, one of Yojimbo's most famous images is the dog carrying the hand in its mouth. Perhaps then, that's Ned Beaumont's hand that greets Sanjuro at the opening of the film. So Ushitora brings Tokwaiman in to question Sanjuro about where Nui can be found. If there is any doubt about who holds the reins of power, this scene should dispel it. It's Tokwaiman rather than Ushitora who calls the shots. Tokwaiman promises to allow Sanjiro to live if he talks, suggesting that it's Tokwaiman who will make the decision about the samurai's fate. This is Takashi Shimura's only real scene of dialogue in the film. You can see that he looks old and frail, and Kurosawa had stopped using him in substantive roles at this point. This film and its companion picture, Sanjiro, are the only times that Shimura played bad guys for Kurosawa. And when I watch the two films, I have to keep reminding myself that Shimura is meant to be a bad guy. It's because you almost never see him that way in a Kurosawa film. So now we're going to have a little bit more beating. Uh, Sanjiro refuses to give up the information, and that gives our, uh, our friendly giant a chance to do his stuff. And you can get a sense here of the big difference in their sizes. Mufuni is not a very tall man, like most Japanese of his generation, and he looks quite puny compared with this big bruiser. So the wipe leaps us forward a bit in time, and we get this disorienting shot of Mufune upside down. As in the glass key, most of the actual beating takes place off screen, but we see its cumulative effects on the hero's battered face. And just as Alan Ladd does, Mufune now undertakes a very difficult, slow crawl toward the door hoping to get away. And as he does so, there's an interesting and odd bit of sound that we hear, which I've, I've never quite been able to figure out uh, whether it's a sound effect or is a piece of Sato's music score. We hear a few percussive beats that seem to correspond, if it's music, with noises that Mufuni might be making as he crawls forward. 
although there's no real evidence on screen that he's making these sounds. So I've always wondered whether these beats that we hear, are they music or are they sound effects? Uh, to me, it's a little ambiguous. Kurosawa is going to give us a real flourish here, one of those passages that shows us just how brilliant he is as a director. It's an example of purely visual storytelling. Sanjiro collapses with fatigue and despair, turns his face to the camera, but something's going to catch his eye. And Kurosawa plays everything in a close-up of his face as Sanjiro looks off frame. And watch the way that Miyagawa gradually brings the key light up to a blazing intensity, which visually encapsulates Sanjiro's narrowing of attention and his rush of emotion. On Rashomon, Miyagawa and Kurosawa had used a mirror to reflect bright sunlight into the faces of the characters, and the lighting here recalls their work in that film. So we get some close-ups of the broken lock using the signature axial compositions, followed by a cut back to Sanjiro's face, everything forming a rhythmic hole. Mifune crawls forward, slipping into and out of the key light, which continues to blaze brightly. Now, in the Hammett story, Ned Beaumont escaped from his tormentors by starting a fire while they were in the next room, and then he jumped through the open door when they came to investigate. But Kurosawa gives the escape a more comic inflection by having Sanjiro hide in the trunk, leaving his captors baffled. None too bright, like a lot of the bad guys in the movie, they seem to think he has vanished into thin air. And when they go out to search, Kurosawa will launch into an extended comic sequence with Sanjiro creeping under the flooring of the house while the gangsters scurry about loudly overhead. What we will see with Sanjiro under the floorboards is a comic reversal of a famous scene in the kabuki play Chushingura, in which the hero, Uranosuke, reads a scroll letter containing information on the whereabouts of his enemy, while one of the enemy's samurai hides beneath a veranda and listens. And look at the hot top light here burning straight down on Mifune, a series of hard lights along the floor as he crawls through. They add considerably to our sense of the beating and brutality that Sanjiro has endured. We don't know quite the nature of the beating, but it seems to have afflicted his legs. He has to crawl using mostly upper body strength. And it's while in this weakened condition that he's most vulnerable in the story. Really, it's the only point at which he is this vulnerable. So he's got to go into hiding to survive and Kurosawa reprises this motif of concealment. Kurosawa's heroes have never had to hide before. They've always confronted the world's evils quite directly and openly. But the world here is so wicked, so corrupt, to a degree that's unprecedented in his films and to a degree that he realized needed to become comic in its proportions, that our hero has to hide. So he joins, however briefly, those characters like Ganji, Kohei, and Nui who must hide and flee, lest they be destroyed. We're going in now to the little uh, riff on Chushingura. It's, um, it's a reference that um, all of the Japanese audiences who watched the movie would have understood because this kabuki play is the story of the loyal 47 Ronin. And um, the sequence that Kurosawa is parodying here is one of the most famous in the film. So, Yojimbo is a variation on the usual heroic structure in Kurosawa's films, where the, the heroes have battled injustice on behalf of the unfortunate. So their confrontations with oppression always carried a moral principle. The doctors in Drunken Angel and Redbeard, the Seven Samurai, these are heroes fighting for more than strictly personal motives. But Sanjiro is different. His fight against the Yakuza and merchants does carry a principle, but it's Kurosawa's principle, not Sanjiro's. Sanjiro isn't motivated by any strong feelings of outrage over what the merchant economy has done to the town, but Kurosawa is, and so he dreams up Sanjiro as the manifestation of those feelings. But Sanjiro doesn't share them. He isn't personally motivated at a deep level to combat the Yakuza and the merchants. So in this way, he's rather like a chess piece that Kurosawa is moving. And in this regard, his blankness is another of those elements that tremendously influenced Sergio Leone. 
who took that quality and ran with it to great effect in his Dollars films, making the Clint Eastwood character a complete cipher. But this lack of passion is part of Sanjuro's great appeal. He's cool in a very specific 1960s way. He's a cool hero, not a fiery one. It's this lack of personal motive that distinguishes him from the other Kurosawa heroes, and it's a change that hints at what is coming in Kurosawa's cinema, the great loss of heroes that coincides with Kurosawa's deepening pessimism about the nature of the world and the way that it resists change or reformation. Apart from these two companion films, Yojimbo and Sanjuro, Kurosawa will make only one more film with a hero, Redbeard, and then there are no more dramas about trying to tackle the world's evil head on. And so the peculiar nature of our hero in Yojimbo points to this great evolution in Kurosawa's work that is just around the bend. But having said that Sanjiro isn't deeply motivated by principle like Kurosawa's other heroes, it's also necessary to state the obvious here. We're feeling the thrill of excitement because we're sensing Kurosawa's masterful setup for the climax. Sanjiro does have a burning desire, but it's not one of principle, it's one of revenge. He's got to kill these bad guys because they've walloped the tar out of him. And so our hero, therefore, is undergoing that archetypal narrative pattern in adventure stories that involves a great ordeal, a fall or a disgrace from which he must recover and then rise to a greater height of power, a display that enhances the magnitude of his heroism. So we feel Kurosawa engaging this archetypal story structure, and he's going to give us everything we want and then more. We get some very crowded compositions here as Ushitora and his bunch crowd into Ganji's tavern looking for Sanjiro. While the two Yakuza bosses have seemed equally wicked throughout the film, as I've noted, Ushitora has always seemed a little more ruthless, less hesitant, less of a vacillator than Sebe. And now he'll seize the upper hand and wipe out Sebe's gang and family. And look at Inokishi. He finds this prospect to be completely delightful. Unosuke is a bit more cautious, and after the others leave, he hangs around for a moment because he's got a pretty good idea that Ganji is misleading them about Sanjiro's whereabouts. Unosuke's perceptiveness makes him a good adversary for Sanjiro, and it makes the two of them a bit alike. Nakadai is an excellent foil for Mifune, and Kurosawa clearly realized this because he cast them again as adversaries in the follow-up film Sanjiro. And the pairing that Yojimbo established proved irresistible for other directors. Mifune and Nakadai square off memorably in Masaki Kobayashi's Samurai Rebellion, and poor Nakadai, as in Yojimbo and Sanjiro, again comes out the loser. So perhaps, therefore, when he encounters Mifune in Kihachi Okamoto's Sword of Doom, he decides not to fight, but merely watches as Mifune cuts down his men. With this splendid promise from Sanjiro that we're going to see a bit more killing, we get a wipe to the next scene. And Kurosawa follows this uh, tantalizing promise with a big massacre sequence. We've leaped forward a bit in time, as Kurosawa tends to do. The off-screen noise that we're hearing is from Ushitora's attack on Sebe's bunch, already in progress when we pick up the scene. It's off-screen, though, because Kurosawa is honoring his point-of-view structure. Sanjiro isn't there to see it, so we're not going to see it yet either, at least not yet. And so what we have before that is a wonderful extended joke, as Kurosawa maneuvers Sanjiro into a position from which he can watch the attack so that we, the movie viewers, might be permitted to see it too. When Ganji tells him what's happening, Sanjiro thinks it'll be fun to watch, and so he tells Ganji to put him down, but this spot here won't do. It's not a very good vantage point. Sanjiro wants a better view, and it's only when he gets it that Kurosawa lets us see what's going on. With this smooth pan of the camera, Kurosawa brings the fiery spectacle into view. We've got burnt rubble in the foreground, Ushitora stands by a blazing fire in the background, and smoke billows from Sebe's place. When Sanjiro peers over the casket, we get the closer views, although these are not meant to be his point of view shots. And now another musical performance begins. This one, a literal dance of death, as Sebe's men are cut down in a close choreography with Sato's score. We also hear the slashing sounds from the swords as they cut into flesh and clothing. 
This was another of Kurosawa's innovations in the film. He wanted to hear the sounds that a sword fight would make when the blade hits home. And we're going to hear those sounds much more emphatically in the second film, Sanjuro. Eno comes bounding out, proud and happy at his kill, and now he's learned to count at least a bit better than when we met him out on the street outside the Coopers. He holds up two fingers without hesitation, but for Ushitura, two dead is not enough, and so he smacks Eno in the head and sends him off. Sato continues his cartoonishly literal approach to scoring by reprising the geisha theme as they run out, and Ushitura's men spare them but grab Orin. They're not going to spare her. And Kurosawa gives Yamada a memorable death scene, and one that seems especially cold-blooded. We hear Ino's sword go into her, and the slaughter of the family that follows seems especially horrifying. Note how Kurosawa also reprised the cry of Oka. We've had a lot of violence in the movie, but Kurosawa has handled it extremely well. He's kept it modulated and under control so that these killings of Orin, Yorichiro, and Sebe have a real impact. We feel these deaths with a level of severity that we haven't experienced before in the movie, where the killings have often been comical. Not here, though, and Kurosawa's ability to create this difference in tone shows how in control of his material he is. A lesser director could not orchestrate these differences in tone as fluidly as Kurosawa. Now all of this death and all of these fires take Yojimbo to the apocalyptic level. Kurosawa is giving us the apocalypse here, showing us the end of a world, not just of a town. He's showing us a world that is violently consuming itself. It is the world of modernity that was coming into being at the end of the Tokugawa period as a desire for commodities replaced Confucian and samurai values of thrift and frugality. And so in this regard, Yojimbo prefigures and points toward the great apocalyptic visions that Kurosawa offered us a generation later in Kagamusha and Ran on a much more epic scale. And as he did in those films, so he does here. He turns away from the future and aligns himself with the past. Now we set up one of the film's most splendid joke sequences. The Cooper has run off and they're stuck. They've got nobody to help carry Sanjiro except the thick-headed Ino who wanders over. Daisuke Kato is so splendid in this comic role that it's a real shame Kurosawa didn't use him this way more often. This, in fact, was the last time that Kato would appear in a Kurosawa film, although they did work together again when Kato appeared in the 1965 remake of Kurosawa's first film, Sanshiro Sugata. Kurosawa produced that remake. So Ganji fools Inokishi into helping carry Sanjiro to the graveyard by questioning his courage. Maybe he is afraid of ghosts. You can see that Ino is a little bit uh, suspicious here. And uh, Kurosawa again shows us how good he is at widescreen filmmaking. See all the bodies there in the background between them. And uh, Ino says that, no, he's quite, uh, quite happy with ghosts. They don't bother him. And when he says that, we get a wipe to Kato on the run into the graveyard, doing a really silly jog and nervously looking out for those ghosts. He thinks maybe they're close by and ready to grab him. And they probably are, given all the men he's killed. Miyagawa said he used an 800 or 900 millimeter lens to shoot this shot. This scene, though, like all of Kurosawa's great work, moves on several levels. We have our fun, but Kurosawa is also being very honest with us here and with himself. In reality, samurai like Sanjiro would be the great historical losers in the drama Kurosawa is giving us. The merchant class would take over Japan, and the samurai would disappear forever. So it's fitting that Sanjiro is taken to a cemetery, where Ganji will tell him that he looks more dead than alive. Sanjiro is a specter. He is a ghost that will be created by history. And he's also a spectral figure of Kurosawa's imagination, a figure of fantasy. 
given form by the intensity of Kurosawa's wishes that history might have taken a different course, and by the depth of his animosity for the political and economic reach of the Yakuza in modern Japan. And so Sanjiro returns to his point of origin in this scene, from which he will be revivified with enough power to alter the course of history and bring about a different outcome. Sanjiro rises up out of the coffin, looking very much like a ghost indeed, and you can see how it unnerves Ganji. More of this typical uh, Miyagawa and Kurosawa lighting that they did in Rashomon. And then uh, Mofuni does a, an awkward little fall in that casket. Now this minute and a half is one of the greatest 90 seconds that you're ever going to see in the movies. Lots of turbulence pointing to the violence to come with the wind kicking up the water in the foreground and the trees and weeds. Seven quick shots of a recovered Sanjiro practicing his knife throws on a leaf animated by that wind we saw howling outside. These are, in fact, trick shots done in reverse. In the next moment, the Cooper is going to arrive with bad news about Gon. And Sanjiro will be prepared to fight with the knife, but the Cooper, it turns out, has brought him a dead man's sword. Appropriate, since a sword was the samurai's soul, and Sanjiro, as a specter, a ghost, creating an anti-history, would in fact need a dead man's sword. Kurosawa uses this high-angle shot to place Sanjiro against the agitated water, and he's hitting Mifune with a powerful wind machine so that everything is dynamic. Movies don't get any better than this. This kind of extraordinary shot shows us just how great Kurosawa is. Sanjiro is willing to fight with the knife, but uh, Gan has the sword for him, and when Sanjiro picks up the dead man's sword, Kurosawa gives us this magnificent flourish and one of his greatest climaxes ever, with Mifune's fabulous grimace and a wipe slashing across Sanjiro's angry forward stride. And we're into a fantastic showdown, one of Kurosawa's most brilliant and best-loved action scenes. And a literal burst of music there when he moves. This is real deep focus here, shot with a wide lens, and we get another kabuki theater-like opening with Hanske marking the start of our spectacle with his clappers. And look at how cinematic all of this is. Hanske's interrupted cry rouses the curiosity of our thugs, with both Hanske and the thugs reacting to Mifune in the far distance, and Kurosawa follows them with this camera move up to Ganji in the foreground, in extreme close-up in the exaggerated depth of field that we see, the sort that would influence Sergio Leone, who made a trademark out of these sudden switches in depth perspective. And then we're going to get a cut to a shot of Mifune alone, surrounded by the wind and the dust. Kurosawa's wind machines are cranking overtime. You'll never see them work this hard in any other film. And we have this slow advance down the main street, again reminiscent of a Hollywood Western. But the uh, shot changes serve to show us just how serious Sanjiro's situation is. He's facing 10 men, all of them killers. Look at that burst of wind there when the Cooper runs across the frame to free Ganji. That's the biggest burst of wind and dust that we see in the entire film. So the shots now are telling us basically that there's no way that Sanjiro can win. How can he possibly beat 10 men, all of them killers, one of them armed with a pistol? Ganji is quite upset that the coffin maker has brought Sanjiro back to town. He too is convinced that Sanjiro cannot prevail against these odds. So he's going to stand helplessly and watch what he believes is going to be the death of his friend. And we go into a series of very formal geometrically designed shots as we cut back and forth between Mifune and Nakadai, each one framed similarly in a way that suggests an underlying link between them in terms of their social history in this Tokugawa period. Each adversary mirrors the other visually by virtue of their positioning in the frame. In the follow-up film, Sanjiro, Mifune will declare that adversary Nakadai is just like himself, and Kurosawa suggests something like that idea here in visual terms. This is probably Mifune's most mythic and iconic moment in all of the films that he made, the one that audiences have loved him the most for. 
With a grin and a wink, Kurosawa and Mifune embrace the absurdity of what they're proposing, that Sanjiro indeed can kill them all. Mifune smiles and swaggers forward, and it all happens so quickly. He cripples Inosuke's gun hand in a piece of business that director Walter Hill paid homage to in The Warriors. And in this single shot, Sanjiro races from villain to villain, slashing them all to pieces. The fight has a classical simplicity of design that is both elegant and eloquent. In the years that followed, samurai films and action films in general moved toward faster and faster cutting, making action choreography more a matter of editing than of staging for the camera. Kurosawa never went there. He preferred to stage for the camera and relied on great swordplay instructors for his action scenes. And so our farm boy runs off, the same guy that we saw at the beginning of the film, crying Oka, the last time that we hear that motif in the movie. Kurosawa extends his fondness for 90 degree lines of action and camera setups to this shot of Sanjiro and Unosuke arranged perpendicular to one another. Unosuke isn't quite finished yet. He's going to try to catch Sanjiro with the pistol. And in one of the more remarkable moments of the film, Sanjiro is going to allow him to do so betting, accurately it turns out, that Unosuke is too close to death to fire the gun. Unosuke is bleeding to death, and look at that impressive pool of blood that spreads around him as he reaches for his gun. Surrendering his fate to Unosuke and this pistol, ready to die if Unosuke can fire, suggests that Sanjiro is willing to surrender himself to the course of history. Guns help to bring an end to the samurai world, and Kurosawa has always used them as a way of signaling the eclipse of samurai tradition. As a technology imported from the West, they also portend the dawn of modernity, and in 1853, Western gunboats were in fact calling on Japan, forcing the shogun to open its ports and bringing about the downfall of the Tokugawa regime. So in facing the gun, Sanjiro is allowing history to take him, if it will, but it cannot lay claim to him. Kurosawa is constructing an elaborate fantasy in which tradition and the samurai win. He's creating an alternative mythology, a fantastical account of how history might have, should have turned out, if only the process of time had included a moral component to ensure with a kind of Malthusian logic, the destruction of evildoers once they become too numerous. And so, Unosuke is swallowed by darkness. The gun is unable to touch Sanjiro. And in the comic apocalypse Kurosawa has fashioned, only the merchants remain, but not for long. Unosuke's death triggers a final spasm of madness from Tazeman, who begins banging his prayer drum preparatory to an attack on Tequeman. In reality, the future belongs to these merchants. The circulation of money will drive out the rice economy and displace Sanjiro's traditional world. And Tazeman and Tokweman will in time become the Zaibatsu, Japan's huge concentrations of investment capital and heavy industry, which helped drive the nation's expanding empire in the 20th century and proved too powerful even for the American occupation authorities to scale back. But none of this will occur in Kurosawa's anti-history because the merchants will consume each other in a frenzy of destruction. Kurosawa offers this wishful desire right in the midst of Japan's great post-war economic boom, when business embarked on a renewed path of expansion, and when the year 1960, when Kurosawa made the movie, launched a great wave of consumer goods, televisions, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, air conditioners. Note that Tazeman is wearing a short sword. The wearing of swords was the essence of samurai identity, and they were the only class that had the legal prerogative to carry weapons. Nevertheless, as one sign of how fluid the class lines were becoming, many merchants in the period, if they were sufficiently powerful, received permission from local domain authorities to carry one and sometimes two swords, giving them a quasi-samurai status. Tazeman has evidently secured such permission, and he now uses his sword to massacre Tokweman. And as Tazeman emerges drenched in blood, the blood of his business competitor, and quite obviously unhinged, he's no longer a threat to the future. So you can look at how hard that electric light is there on his face. So our, our merchant class has annihilated itself. But Unosuke ain't dead yet. 
and he calls to Sanjiro, what? calling him Samurai Trash. Inosuke is Yakuza rather than Samurai, and so he feels a contempt for Sanjiro despite the fact that in reality many Yakuza modeled themselves on Samurai. Many were descended from Samurai, and most honored the ideals of Bushido that were part of the Samurai world. But in Kurosawa's rendition, the alliance of corruption between Yakuza and Merchant has stripped the gangsters of all claims to ideals. In Kurosawa's portrait, they are simply vermin and riffraff, and with Unosuke dead, Sanjiro stands by the body and offers a kind of benediction, action that Kurosawa reprises at the conclusion of Yojimbo's companion film, Sanjiro. Okay. All that remains now is a final flourish. Satisfied, Sanjiro looks about and notes that it'll be quiet now. It's the quiet of the grave. Kurosawa's hero has remade the world according to the contours of his wish, and now Kurosawa sends him off into myth and legend and into movie history as Mifune's most beloved character and possibly even Kurosawa's most famous. With a final snick of the sword into Ganji's bonds and rapid strides away from the camera set to Masaru Sato's jaunty score, Sanjiro makes a mythic exit, but he lingers in our hearts and Kurosawa wisely did not say goodbye, but brought him back in the film Sanjiro for one more go round and one more epic match with Tatsuya Nakadai. We wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs>